Hi everybody. Uh, welcome to APP to APP virtual lecture series. We have two of um, audiences this evening. Um, APP to APP and my Catholic doctor. And my name is Keiko Kirkendall. Um, I am a stroke nurse practitioner at the Nova Fairfax Hospital in Falls Church, Virginia. I'm going to be presenting stroke mimics and chameleons. Disclosure, I have no financial disclosure to report. So objectives of the, um, this presentation, stroke mimics and chameleons. At the end of this session, the learners will be able to describe the definition of stroke mimics and chameleons and discuss clinical challenges of stroke mimics and chameleons. And we'll be able to manage the uh, triage and or stroke alert, especially those who are working on acute care setting in suspected stroke cases in emergency room or in, in any unit if you're in the hospital. Acute stroke is a medical emergency. It's called brain attack. Um, in the uh, world, time is brain. And in cardiac wars, um, time is muscle. Stroke um, often present as sudden onset of a symptom and a focal neurological symptoms related to a vascular territory. So it's like a, sometimes um, multiple vascular territories are involved. Uh, most strokes are ischemic in origin up to 80 plus percent and about 15 percent uh, strokes are hemorrhagic strokes. Ischemic strokes can be further classified as large vessel uh, disease, atherosclerosis disease, and cardioembolic. And SBD, small vessel disease, is a lacoon strokes. And the others are um, ESOS, embolic stroke of unknown sources that we can't identify the um, causes of the strokes. This is a, a real patient picture that I had. Um, as you see, there's a CT scan, and then um, uh, there is a CT angiogram here. The area here, it's got a cut off uh, left MCA stroke. We found this uh, stroke pretty early, um, so he was able to get the um, IV uh, thrombolytics and went to mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, the initial presentation in the community setting when the stroke patient was seeing, you know, the initial presentation, um, initial finding is in the home, nursing homes, anywhere in the community. So be fast for those people, uh, non-medical people, we educate with be fast, balanced eyes, balance, imbalanced eyes, deviated gaze, cannot see face droopy, arms weakness, one side arm is weaker, and the speech is disturbed, usually slurred, and um, on time, that we want to know the time they found it or they, they saw the onset. And uh, for the EMS, Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale, they use um, our EMS in our area, they use this um, scale. For van, uh, vision, aphasia, neglect, on top of the uh, arm weakness, we uh, use this for um, large vessel occlusion um, identification. The stroke, um, it can be, um, it often present with the uh, focal, non-focal symptoms and the non-focal, focal, we have to differentiate when we think about stroke or non-stroke and a positive or negative symptoms. Stroke often has negative symptoms. Negative mean loss of uh, vision, loss of motor strength. The positive would be something like uh, severe pain, some eyes, you, you are seeing something. And when they roll in, we, um, we have NIHS scale at the um, beginning of the ED triage. Here is the uh, uh, like a um, picture of van weakness, vision, aphasia, neglect, and the BFAS. Um, I'm sure you see this a lot. And the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale. So again, focal or non-focal. Focal means hemiparesis, aphasia, 
these are three sensory symptoms changing vision vertigo. And non focal can be something I often hear from the ED, um, ED providers, generalized weakness, patient is confused, uh, lost consciousness, and lightheaded feeling. This, this is something different from dizziness with the room spinning feeling. It's just, you know, you can, it, it doesn't really necessarily relate it to a specific vascular territory. Okay. Positive or negative? Again, positive symptom, visual. Uh, you are seeing something like, you know, oh, I see like black spots and flashing or pain, yeah, I have so severe pain on one side of the body, every, everywhere with jerky, or negative, this is the case, most of the cases, stroke cases, loss of vision, can't see, loss, decreased sensation, decreased um, um, strength, yeah, um, you know, one side is totally not moving, cannot speak, those, those are negative symptoms that can be uh, most likely stroke. So stroke evolution, this is for you guys, for your homework. This is the uh, um, uh, CT scan, MRI or stroke evolution from the time of presentation to day two, day one, day three, how stroke shows on the CT scan and the MRI of the brain and the MRI head of the neck. Okay, just because of time, I'm just going to skip, but you can scan the QR, uh, QR code or you can go to this um, uh, YouTube site. Now, we are finally coming to stroke mimics and chameleons. So mimics, initial presentation when they roll in, it's a medical condition that look like stroke. Yeah, it look like a stroke, but at the end, uh, it ended up negative for stroke. It's not the stroke, but it looked like stroke when they come in. Chameleons, stroke chameleons. Initial presentation, it doesn't look like, uh, it does look at a, like a medical condition. It doesn't look like stroke. But um, at the end, when you do the stroke workup, it came, it comes back as positive for stroke. Okay, so why do we care about this mimics and chameleons? Um, because time is brain, and it's not easy to uh, differentiate mimics and chameleons, especially when you are in the hyper acute phase in the emergency room, you have maybe 10 minutes to think about it, or maybe less five to three minutes. We, we don't want to lose even one second because the brain cell is dying every, every second. And you, you don't want to spend too much time on different shows. And what do we do? Time is brain. So, and mimics, you think this is most likely mimics because of your experience or everybody's input so there must be um something is going on medically you still have to provide a very um hyper acute acutely ill patient the uh, appropriate medical interventions for the chameleons uh, this is more serious um it's hard to uh, identify chameleon cases at the very beginning therefore at risk for delayed or missed diagnosis and um, possible interventions because after the fact you know if you you spend the time work up and the next day oh actually that was positive for stroke it didn't look like it but it was positive and then when you look back oh patient actually came in with a time window of avitromaletic he was here within two hours. He couldn't get an IV thrombolytics. Common stroke mimics is seizure, migraine, uh, metabolic derangement, especially high um, hypoglycemia, um, encephalopathy, dizziness, uh, recrudescence of old stroke. Um, I, I see this quite often too, and functional disorders. And common chameleon is autodimental status, um, dizziness, and ataxia, and headache, 
uh, can be chimerian. Okay. So um, before we go through more um, history taking in stroke um, assessment is very, very, very important. I think anything, um, any medical condition, history taking is very important, but uh, for the stroke uh, cases, is this witnessed or it just found like this, or did you witness the symptom onset? And what is the concern, uh, whoever found, or even patient can tell, what is your concern about your symptoms? What is the exact symptoms? And you have to, you know, ask um, in a way they can tell you the exact uh, what that is. Because um, at time is brain, again, time is sensitive. So you have to make sure you are asking appropriate questions so they can answer you in a timely manner. So what was the patient doing at the time of the onset? That is very important, like a fall um, out of the mental status at the time of the onset of symptoms. What was the patient doing? Fall, oh, we, uh, he, she was trying to go upstairs and she fell, or what is this? Or was, was she taking shower and fell? So. Uh, time of symptom discovery, um, this is important because it um, is this the symptom witness or what you just found. That's different. And time last known well, normal baseline. The time last known baseline of the patient because we have to know this because it, it um, Within 4.5 hours, we can give IV thrombolytics. That's the reason we need to know time last known baseline. Okay, and the baseline cognitive and functional status. And this is another um, part we often kind of forget um, when we offer uh, um, mechanical thrombectomy. One of the criteria we have to kind of discuss is what is the patient baseline? Is he a bed bound? Or is this patient totally functional, just like, you know, going to work, driving, nothing, nothing wrong, but came in with acute onset of stroke symptoms. Um, oftentimes, we we do not offer thrombectomy for such as like a, a severe a functional disabled patient, which is, you know, bed bound, um, not really doing anything, can do ADLs. Um, so that's the reason we need to know the baseline. And a significant past and recent medical surgical history and medication, alcohol, substance um, abuse, everything because those are the things affect your mental status and cognition. Okay. Case one, 73 years old female with a past medical history of um, out of the mental status, possibly seizures, and upper GI bleed two weeks ago, and dementia, and strokes, oh, and proximal AFib, left breast cancer present with headache, Recur uh, recurrence of auto mental status. Uh, last known well was reported need 10 p.m. EMS said 10 p.m., but there was no way to confirm. Family wasn't there. Uh, okay. So blood pressure in 200, glucose is okay, 132, and she's very agitated. We had a hard time um, get through the even quick CT scan. And um, I found right gaze preferences. It's not good when you see the right, you know, gaze preferences because um, highly suspicion of stroke now. And initial NIHS is uh, 14 to digit. It's not good either. And what is modified ranking score? This is the uh, scoring for baseline functional mobility. So, um, but I can confirm, we are suspecting possibly stroke, possibly large vessel occlusion because the gaze and um, um, initial NIH is, is so high, but um, 
we don't know what is the exact baseline. Um, however, um, CT head, CT angiogram, perfusion, all without acute process. So at least large vessel occlusion case was ruled out. So we ended up saying this is likely seizure. We don't have a large vessel occlusion, no hemorrhagic stroke on a stat CT scan. Perfusion doesn't look like anything uh, significant. Um, and then history of questionable seizure. I saw the medication list and she has um, anti-epileptic. Um, then finally family came in, the patient has been off baseline with low energy for maybe two days. Has not been taking Kepra. The daughter said, well, um, mother her mother the patient has been taking lots of medicine including you know um anticoagulant and uh, cholesterol medicine something like uh, vitamins and uh, on top of that she has to take kepra they thought well that's too much and they didn't see the quote quote seizure for them seizure is very um jerky movement everywhere and I rolled back. I think she, um, according to her story, she looked like she was having a seizure, like, you know, altered. And um, after altered mental status, she gets more, you know, um, quite too, too combative at times. And she actually said, yes, my mom had a rocky movement when she was, you know, about to, you know, get more agitated. That was the uh, the right before this presentation. <laughs> okay, gaze deviation that she had right side gaze. So for the um, um, stroke and the seizure, patient come with a deviated gaze either way, right or left. For the stroke, um, gaze deviation toward the uh, area of the stroke. And for the seizure, uh, this is an increasing activity in the brain region. And eyes tend to look away from the region. So for the further um, information, there's another YouTube and QR code. It's a very a good short presentation of the gaze deviation. Um, you can take a look at it. And the seizure and the CT perfusion, if you want to take a look at it, um, it's a different CT perfusion mapping compared to um, stroke. Okay, so now case two, going to case two. This is five, uh, 57 years old female with a history of uh, migraine, um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Those are also um, risk factor for stroke and a lower back pain came in with a headache associated with the left arm and a leg weakness and dysarthria. Um, and then blood pressure is also high. This is very typical presentation for stroke because one side is weak, blood pressure is elevated and she does have a um, risk factor obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, so, but when the patient even say, yes, I have a migraine, history of migraine, you might want to ask either patient or family, what is the um, associated symptom, especially when you have a migraine? And this case, last known well, um, at the bedtime, 10.30, and then when she woke up, she woke up with this symptom. So this is more than four or 4.5 hours. So this is, um, we, you know, we, we, we can safely say, well, this is not the case of IV thrombolytic, but it can be wake up stroke. We don't know yet. NIHS is five, not too 
high, not too low, modified ranking score, baseline score zero. Um, when she gets really bad migraine, of course, she gets low, um, worse functioning status, so maybe zero to one. Oh, sorry. So this case was just um, migraine headache because she actually said, yes, I have had these symptoms before with bad migraine. And um, yes, this is, but this time I had a leg weakness too. So that's why I wanted to make sure that's what she told us. Of course, we cannot um, totally root out uh, stroke at this moment in the emergency room. So she was admitted for migraine and a stroke workup and it came back, uh, MRI came back negative for stroke. So then in uh, case three, metabolic derangement. Uh, very soft case, but we have to go through. This is important. 47 years old male with a past medical history of obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Again, uh, he has risk factor for stroke. Present with weakness, uh, fatigue, dizziness, low energy, very fatigue, and generalized weakness for a few days. Um, even though it's not you know hyper acute uh, treatment case. Uh, ED was still, ED provider was still concerned. Uh, yeah, it has to be, you know, stat consult because we really don't know what's going on here. NHS is zero. He's weak, but he can do everything on NHS exam. And he revealed, oh, by the way, recently diagnosed with a diabetes and started on metformin about a week or so ago, metformin. And a wife was at the bedside. Um, by the way, we have been working on a diet too because we want to be healthy. And they, they revealed, well, actually they were eating less, a lot less than like two weeks ago. So uh, what I want to get here is uh, very important. So education, um, patient education at the primary care level, especially. Um, he was studying on metformin, the anti-diabetes, but uh, he's eating less. He may be skipping, we don't know. Uh, we can't skip the meal if you're on the medication like this. And um, um, you're on the metformin to um, change the uh, blood glucose level and if you are not eating, your blood glucose may be becoming uh, lower than expected. And you have to really educate the patient. You have to eat um, appropriate diet, appropriate portion size, and you have to take medication as prescribed on time and working on the diet as well. But you cannot change everything at all once because it's, it, you, you might feel sicker than before if you do so. You just have to work on it consistently over the three to six months to one year. That's a um, very important point of the uh, primary care, okay? And uh, uh, metabolic derangement can be hypoglycemia, and this is the uh, many um, stroke mimic cases in the emergency room, or even hyperglycemia. Another one is hyponatremia, like sodium is like a 117, 119, 120. It can be very, um, um, presentation can be a stroke-like symptoms with uh, acute confusion. And uremia, hyper, um, um, ammonia level is elevated because of the liver disease. And then those symptoms with the metabolic issue is out of the mental status. And the delirium can be hypoactive or hyperactive, as they did, or it's just not like her, it's just too quiet, too sleepy. And nausea vomiting, and it can be seizure with hypoglycemia, hyponatremia. And case four, let's go to case four. This is a 72 years old male with a past medical history of hypertension and BPH, nothing serious, presents with acute onset of auto mental status. Uh, wife said uh, he slumped down from sofa while watching TV. So he was fine till this evening. You hear this, he was fine 
this evening, till this evening. Uh, but he was shaking. So when you hear shaking, slumped down, you kind of going toward and possibly seizure. But does he have a seizure um, risk factor? Doesn't look like it. And the CT had revealed lesion suspicious for malignancy on the stat CT scan. So further imaging revealed lesion in lungs and kidneys. And uh, after this diagnosis, he had uh, a few recurrence seizures. And uh, for the brain mass and the stroke, how it shows on the CT scan, uh, the two of the left side pictures are brain mass lesions, uh, brain tumors uh, from the radiopedia. And these two left side, two of them are strokes. This is um, ischemic stroke. It's probably more than you know a few days because it's already showing hypodensity. It can be old stroke, and this is the hemorrhagic stroke uh, right here, the white hyperdensity, and this is um, these two um, brain mass. It, you can see the uh, clear differences how it present on the stat CT scan at the beginning. I'm um, going to next encephalopathy um, can be due to infection, CNS or non-CNS, brain, um, you get the um, meningitis or non-CNS, um, notorious one is UTI. Uh, metabolic issues like we discussed and the brain mass again, hydrocephalus, uh, chemical toxin exposure, um, hypoxia, uh, with the COVID, yes, we had a COVID encephalopathy too, and a poor nutrition. Uh, recrudescence of stroke, uh, we're going to recrudescence, is the uh, return, recurrence of the old previous re resolved stroke related symptoms. It comes with acute illnesses like uh, let's say um, she, um, I had a stroke like uh, three years ago with the right side weakness. It all resolved. I went to physical therapy. It all resolved, but I had this acute infection with the flu. And uh, on top of that, uh, look like, you know, I'm developing the pneumonia. And all of a sudden, my right side weakness, um, it, it seems like, you know, stroke, but I had had the same symptoms before. It's like, you know, coming back. It comes with a metabolic derangement, um, like, you know, um, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, something like that. And also uh, excessive fatigue. Um, it can be any of the reason you are tired, especially for the elderly population, had a stroke before, and um, as we aged up, there are so many other things going on and she or he was able to do things maybe five, 10 years ago without much problem, but now like went to trip for like a seven days trip to Disney World with the grandkids, came back home. It seems a little sicker than before. Excessive fatigue can bring up recrudescence of old stroke, okay? Yeah, um, you will be amazed how people do around there, you know, oh, yeah, my parents were fine, like, you know, five years ago, we did this trip, and we thought we would have fun, but, um, yeah, she's got sick again, um, so, yeah, be careful when you take your elderly parents or elderly friends to trip, you have to plan accordingly. So this is another um, reading for the recrudescence of deficit after stroke. And then we're going to functional disorders. Um, as, so functional disorder is very tricky, but usually um, what I see is emergency room nurses know about this patient because um, quite frequently, several similar presentations in the past. 
oh, such, such came with the same symptom. Oh, she was here like uh, three weeks ago. Oh, I saw her like two months ago with this. I hear this quite often, but we still have to go over this, you know, stroke assessment because um, stroke is the, uh, you know, very um, serious disease. So, and when you look at the, you know, symptoms and the previous presentation and the previous workup and explained physical symptoms, sometimes, you know, it's really look like a stroke. One side is weak, can't talk and uh, it, it look like stroke or sometimes it's, it just doesn't make sense. Like one arm is weak and other side of the leg is weak. It just doesn't make sense. And history of extensive workup, like MRI, uh, echo, and uh, all kinds of workup for several times a year because of the stroke-like symptoms, but all came back negative so far. And then no organic causes identified. And when you do the exam, if it's most likely or possibly due to functional disorders, often see giveaway weakness. Is this like a drift or something different than stroke drift? Okay. And a drop arm, um, patient does not drop the arm on the face and the head. You cannot say, well, oh, this isn't a stroke, but you might want to just go, you know, go through this giveaway weakness and drift. You look at the drift, how the arms drop to where, and uh, who was assigned, as you see on the picture here. Um, okay, functional disorders um, assessment. You have this. Um, tips and a point of assessment for the functional disorders. Okay. So for the, uh, this case was posterior circulation, quite a size of posterior circulation stroke, a misdiagnosis case and the ED triage because the NIH is zero and the vital signs fine. And it was very um, not clear sim stroke-like symptoms. So um, for this uh, posterior circulation, he actually say stumbled. I I've never had this before. It's very unusual. So um, I often have patient walk if it's appropriate, medically appropriate. I have them walk to see if I can see a, a toxic gait. A, a toxic gait means very out of proportion gate that you can of you see often on the uh, posterior circulation stroke so um if you suspect it you can have them walk to see if he or she can walk straight without any problem that's another um exam point for posterior circulation stroke and another business case 49 years old came in, my, uh, history of migraine and some cholesterol with acute onset of dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and a photophobia. This was my patient. Um, unable to get up and ambulate. He does not, he did not want to participate on the exam because he gets nauseous. He can't open his eyes. He said, that's just, just too much. I, I get nauseous and I'm gonna vomit. I don't want to, I get dizzy too. Onset of symptoms, 4.30, in ED by ambulance, 8.13. So technically, um, he had, I mean, he, he didn't have much wiggle time, but in the emergency room, it, thought, it was thought to be migraine, due to migraine, but he actually later said, you know, I have migraine, but I never had this severe symptom before. So, and then not responding to IV fluid, bolus, mag, zofran, meclizine, nothing worked. At that time, 
um, night shift provider, you know, it's um, shift change around the evening time, night shift provider was concerned, you know, um, if it's a large vessel, I don't know, but either way, can you come look at this patient? And stroke alert was later in the evening, almost like midnight. So continues. And then when I saw him, yeah, he doesn't want to do exam. He's too um, too nauseous, too dizzy, and too sensitive. And I finally see horizontal nystagmus bidirectional, not only uh, one side. And broad vision in left eye only. He say, yeah, I I I I I only see the movement. I can see that, but I can't see. And still dizzy and nauseous, and yeah, it was very difficult exam. He tried, but he just can't. And I just is zero because nystagmus is not the NA, part of the NHS, as that's not the gaze or cut. And he doesn't have a cut, he just had some vision disturbance. Uh, diagnosis came back. Right cerebellar, that was quite large right cerebellar strokes with left vertebral occlusion. Uh, etiology, uh, when I checked back the, um, um, the chart, we couldn't identify the uh, specific etiology that was not atheral, that was not the cardioembolic. It, it's probably fall into the category of ESS, unknown source. But uh, yes, he had a quite significant stroke. And this is also missed delayed diagnosis case. Uh, that's how posterior saturation is very difficult to pick up at the presentation. So this is his imaging. Um, it's quite large. This is the left cerebellar stroke right here. And he actually had the right cerebellar stroke too and very small one. And this is uh, left vert is occluded. Yeah. And for the gaze um, exam, again, for the hyperacute phase like him, it's very difficult to do the exam like such as hint exam, but uh, just for your information, especially when you have up-to-date access, um, acute onset sustained vertigo, you have this, you know, nice uh, gaze assessment tools and it's explained so well in one shot. So you might want to look at it. Okay. Uh, dysmetry ataxia, we are going through this posterior saturation because it can be presented as a uh, chimerium. So this was another case of posterior circulation stroke after the fact we found it. This was not the uh, hyperacute uh, treatment case because we found it after five, six, seven hours the cat. But um, the point is it took longer than expected to get to the uh, stroke team involvement um, because they tried to figure for at least a half day that we, we should send him home, but he's insisting, no, I don't want to go home because I feel different. This is not normal. Finally, in the evening, like 8 p.m., after so many times he said he doesn't want to go home, they call for stroke consult because they thought, well, maybe one side of the arm seems to be weaker. That's it. But you have to listen to the patient and um, get the, uh, you know, the neurology or stroke team involved uh, earlier than, you know, after all afternoon, because um, it's important to diagnose and uh, get to the right treatment, you know, earlier in the phase. And case seven, out of the mental status, 65 years old, history, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, no medical exam uh, prior to this. I mean, like he hasn't been to primary care for annual, that's what I meant. Um, recently diagnosed, like maybe a month ago or so, hypertension, diabetes, but before that, he wasn't going to um, primary care. Uh, present with autosomal status, difficulty of breathing, 
found by his uh, significant other at 1 a.m. She woke up with this, oh my gosh, what's going on? And um, EMS reported last known well 1 a.m. That doesn't make sense. Found 1 a.m., last known 1 a.m. But uh, anyway, um, blood pressure is high, glucose is fine. NIH is, is bad, 29. It's really high because basically there's no exam because he's not doing anything. Modified ranking, he's a functional guy who still works and do the things, so only 65. And actually last known well, according to his significant other, thank God she was there to provide all those information. 10.30 at the bedtime, they went to bed, he was just a normal baseline, 10.30, and she woke up at 1 a.m. because of this. And uh, this was case of vascular occlusion. As you see on this picture, uh, he had had a small um, strokes before on the right posterior, probably undiagnosed, no symptom that uh, the time of the uh, stroke, but here, uh, vascular occlusion, I wasn't sure, but uh, his present presentation from the previous experience and uh, imaging, this is a CT scan stat uh, when he came in. Uh, we are talking um, on the uh, on-call stroke physician on the phone, hey, is it the vascular? Um, he wasn't sure, it may be calcification, but the exam is bad. And, the confirmed ranking score zero, last known 10.30, it's 2 a.m. By the time we get through this, it was 2 a.m. What's the next steps? We are in the hyperacute phase. So we only have less than like whatever, 30, 40 minutes or something, but um, we did give him IV thrombolytic right on. Um, we concluded um, with the radiologist, this was case of asthma. And he needed to be intubated to go to uh, interventional radiology. Uh, neuro IR was activated. They had to come in middle of the night. Yes, they had to come in stat. And he went to the mechanical thrombectomy. Um, on his case, um, by the time he got to the uh, thrombectomy um, area, the uh, occlusion was gone with the uh, possibly, uh, most likely with IV thrombomedic and headache, case eight. This is also my case. That was a very um, um, notable case. So I still remember 38 years old female, 30 weeks pregnant. Um, when we he hear a pregnant lady coming in, we get very nervous regardless. So because, I, I don't have much experience dealing with pregnant ladies, and um, it's a you know it's a different uh, case scenario when you have the, when you are dealing with two people at the same time, the late mother and the child here, with a past medical history of uh, gestational diabetes in the past, but no diabetes after. We came in with a headache, with a fatigue, weakness, and photophobia. Um, but 30 weeks pregnant, 38 years old, um, she fell, uh, fell into high risk uh, pregnancy category here with age. And blood pressure looks okay. Um, everything is uh, glucose okay, but he, she said the headache is like a bad. And also found to have hemiparesis and decreased sensation in the right side up and the lower. Um, she, it's a very effort dependent exam. Um, too heavy, I can do, I, you know, like a, some sort of like a migraine like presentation. They, they are very effort dependent. I can do, that's what she's saying. And they, uh, actually when you encourage her to do that, she can do it, but she said that's just too heavy. And I just three for the arm sensation and the arm uh, drift and the modified ranking baseline. She's functional, only 38, has a couple kids and uh, no deficit. 
Um, yes, uh, due to headache and photophobia, she was uh, not well participating in the exam. I did as much as I can. Uh, what's your differential diagnosis? Um, you know, everybody thought, well, maybe migraine. She had a uh, recent presentation with some headache like a month ago or so to the emergency room, responded to migraine treatment like IV fluid, and she was discharged. It could, could be, again, headache, undiagnosed migraine is causing this. Maybe, but again, 30 weeks pregnant comes in with this. Um, you want to do a little bit more investigation. Here we go. She has this subacroid hemorrhage. And blood pressure being, you know, normal, 120, 130, and very, um, you know, low NIH, she has subacroid hemorrhage. Um, this case was um, uh, very interesting because after the fact, um, we did all those investigations. Why she's having this subacroid hemorrhage? Aneurysm? No, she did not have an aneurysm. Um, any trauma? No, that's not a trauma or anything like that. Non-traumatic. And, and we really don't know why she had the um, subacroid hemorrhage. Um, so at the time of the chart check, um, we couldn't conclude why she had had that. And she had a quite extensive hospital stay and she went to acute rehab after this. Uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, occlusion of venous um, areas, and it comes with a headache, oftentimes comes with a headache, and nausea vomiting, and uh, out of the mental status, confused or decreased uh, mentation. And the vision changes also, other symptoms comes with that. History of clotting disorders maybe, uh, and a pregnancy or had a baby a few weeks ago. These are the high risk area for cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. I just wanted to mention. And then father, um, uh, homework for you guys. You can look at the YouTube videos, a very good one to understand how, where, and what's the risk factor. And also oral contraceptive can be the cause too. An interesting case I'm going through, 32 years old female, um, sorry, I have a typo. Uh, it's not T, Y, N, O, 32 years old female with a uh, past medical history Down syndrome and um, a AV kind of defect, uh, but she got the repair when she was baby, hyperlipidemia, uh, present with the uh, dysarthria and some left facial droop and then prestige in the left hand. Um, the mother and the father and the brother was also concerned as she went to some uh, uh, practice for play. Uh, she participated in a play group and um, she went to practice and she came home like this and this is not like her. No IV thrombolytic out of window time for this lady. No indication for thrombectomy because there was no large vessel occlusion. And uh, that was out of time window, me more than 4.5 hours since, or we don't know the exact onset time, cannot identify. And symptom resolved in the emergency room actually, uh, but still had some left face um, um, difference on the, my exam. What could be the etiology of the stroke? Yes, she had a stroke. So this case, this lady, um, we couldn't identify the uh, specific cause of the uh, stroke. It can follow of ESAS, again, embolic stroke of unknown sources. But one thing I wanted to mention this case was she was started on oral contraceptive. I don't know the reason why she was started on oral contraceptive at this time, but uh, yes, she was just started on oral contraceptive about two months prior to this stroke presentation. 
So of course, you know, um, with having a stroke diagnosis, no more oral contraceptive for this lady. And interesting case two, uh, 72 old years old female with a past medical history, AFib, hypertension, cervical cancer, vulvar cancer, and present with the dysarthria, right facial droop, right sided, everything is right side. And this 72 years old female still works at the barber shop. That's how um, the coworker found her with a slurring speech during the break time at 6 p.m. She was working all day. She works, you know, part time. And then that was a day she was happened to be at the barber shop, six o'clock in the back, back room. The co worker noticed, call 911 by 7 p.m. in the emergency room. And I just stand with the right side symptom, modified ranking zero. So interesting case, as you see on the CT angiogram here, she had a right M2 cut. Uh, this is the right side um, M MCA territory stroke. And on top of that, incidental finding, uh, I wonder if you can see the yellow highlighted area, large unruptured aneurysm. This is incidental finding. She never had the, you know, any headache or anything like that before. So um, for this case, she was not taking anticoagulant for having an AFib because I believe um, it was very difficult for her to buy um, anticoagulant at such as Eliquis because um, this is this can be very expensive and uh, I don't think she has insurance. Um, anyway, so that's that anticoagulant, no anticoagulant, uh, it could, it, it, it's most likely cardioembolic source of a stroke, but we couldn't give IV thrombolytic because of this incidental finding of more than one centimeter unruptured aneurysm. So no IV thrombolytic, and she went to a thrombectomy and um, um, she had extensive um, hospital stay too. I think the uh, case of um, how, um, the discussion was what to do with this aneurysm that was to be discussed with the uh, interventional radiology conference within the team. Um, that was the last time I saw the uh, chart, uh, the chart check time. Okay. All right. Uh, so the inpatient stroke alert, just this is for the bonus. Uh, if you happen to work in an acute care setting, uh, you can use this, um, the nursing SBAR tool for the nurses. This is basically um, what nurses have to report in case they are suspecting stroke and they call for rapid response or stroke response team, they can use this um, SBA tools. Okay. And then summary, uh, again, go back to mimics and chameleons. Initial presentation is mimics medical condition that look like a stroke, but the final diagnosis is negative. Chameleons, Initial presentation look like other medical condition, doesn't look like stroke, but final diagnosis is positive for stroke. And again, time is brain. Um, stroke mimics are common up to, um, depending on the uh, literature, 25 to 30% of stroke, you know, um, symptom, stroke like symptom coming through the emergency room or the care site. So chimeras are at risk for delayed diagnosis and intervention. We went through these two cases, how it was delayed or missed diagnosis because um, it's not like a clear cut, one side weakness or severe dysarthria aphasia. It comes with a very, um, um, very uh, minor in a way, minor symptoms. But um, again, if you see the uh, patient with the um, ataxia, nystagmus, dizziness, all three together, on top of that, having a nausea, vomiting, you really have to get into this, you know, stroke assessment uh, because uh, possibly it can be um, 
posterior circulation involvement. And a focused and detailed history taking in a timely manner. It's very difficult when you want to detail, you want to spend, but we don't have luxury of spending so much time. So uh, giving the question and get the answer, guide the patient and the family to the point, you know, we, uh, we get the timely manner um, assessment, okay? Manage all suspected stroke cases with urgency. You think this may be most likely migraine, this most likely functional disorder, but we still have to treat all the cases, stroke, um, stroke, um, stroke, possible stroke cases with urgency, because if that is a stroke, we don't want to miss that opportunity of hyperacute treatment. And again, this is a teamwork. Um, you cannot do this by yourself. You work with um, emergency room or nurses and the radiology department and other intensive care and uh, interventional radiology and the radiology team, two radiologists, tech, everybody. We are all together. So teamwork and communication, closed loop communication is very important, especially when you have a limited time and um, uh, you have to do something in the limited time in the hyperacute phase. And this will be the end of the, uh, my presentation. Thank you. If you have uh, questions, uh, my work email is here. And uh, again, go look through this QR code or YouTube website. And then uh, again, references here. Okay. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>